Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Mireya Solis. I'm a senior fellow at Knight Chair in the Foreign Policy Program here at Brookings. And it's a pleasure to be moderating this panel on trade and economic relations between Mexico and the United States. And I think it's very clear from the previous session that this is indeed the topic of the day. Uh, there is so much uncertainty. Uh, we all know that the uh, Trump administration has already sent a letter of notification to Congress to initiate the uh, renegotiations, but there's uh, many questions as to what may be the final outcome of these talks. Because on the one hand, we hear a message about modernization. And I think that's very much needed, especially after the United States government decided to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the idea is that we need to upgrade this trade agreement that is 23 years old, that has framed trade and investment relations between these uh, three parties, but the world economy has changed, and therefore we should indeed adapt uh, and, and incorporate those new rules. But then there are the other messages about the other positions on trade policy, a new direction, if you will, for coming from this administration, an emphasis on bilateral trade deficits, um, an encouragement about Buy American clauses, and skepticism, quite frankly, about the merits of production sharing, which in many ways is the essence of a North American integration uh, project. So I guess uh, this afternoon we have a lot to talk about, and we have a group of uh, experts. I'm going to introduce them very briefly because you'll have the bios. And they're going to start with initial set of remarks, and then we'll open up for a conversation amongst uh, ourselves, and they'll open up for uh, questions from the audience. So I'll start with my uh, colleague, Danny Bahar, who is a fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program here at Brookings. Um, Gary Hofbauer, who's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. And Antonio Ortiz Mena, who is now a senior advisor at the Albright Stone Ridge Group. And Antonio, I have to say, was also involved in the original NAFTA talks. So it would be interesting to get his perspective on what has changed and what hasn't from these two uh, processes. So, uh, Danny, would you like to get us started, please? Sure. Well, thank you for, for um, the opportunity. I, I want to base my remarks basically on three ideas um, that are central to this discussion, maybe frame more with, with I'm going to touch a little bit on very basic economic theory that I think is lacking a little bit in the discussion, at least at the government, on the government side. Um, and, and basically, I want to talk a little bit on the trade deficit with Mexico and overall, um, and on the job losses and the job gains that come out of NAFTA. So the, the bilateral trade deficit with Mexico stands at about $60 billion a year. On, um, and it's similar to the trade deficit with Germany and Japan. It's not even comparable with the trade deficit with China, which is about $350 billion. Um, but I talk about the trade deficit. I start with the trade deficit because it's the measure that the President, the President Trump has the, use, is using to measure whether this is a good deal or a bad deal um, uh, to the level that we can say it's, it's almost an obsession. Um, and, and, and based on that, the president has suggested that some sort of renegotiation will include some tariffs, perhaps, or some difficulties on, making, on importing goods from Mexico or China. Uh, I'm going to leave China aside for today um, and encourage um, exports. Um, so uh, I, I want to stress two points uh, on, on this train of thought. The first one is that um, whatever tariffs or, or renegotiations that could happen um, that, that, that aim to change the flow of trade between Mexico and the U.S. is not really going to change the trade deficit overall for the U.S. Um, and second, um, this, uh, the, the, the idea that the trade deficit is the wrong measure to look at whether um, trade is good or bad or, or the deal is good or bad. So in terms of imposing tariffs, um, uh, the, 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 the idea is that um, what would happen, I mean, imposing tariffs or renegotiating in a way that will make it more expensive to import goods, what the, 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 the final um, uh, person that is going to be hurt by this are the American consumers on the American side. They're going to have to pay a higher cost for their avocados or their coronas or any other <laughs> uh, Mexican good that is coming here. Um, and so, so the train of thought, I think, that is coming out of the administration is, well, when that's going to happen, so then uh, the consumers are going to go and start consuming American goods. But that's actually not the case, uh, because Mexico and the U.S. are not really competing on the same kind of goods. Their export baskets are not that similar. 
So when that happens, American consumers are, just gonna, are gonna move to start importing from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So the trade deficit is gonna move from Mexico to some other country, but overall the trade deficit is really not, not gonna change. Um, but on the, moreover, on the trade deficit as a metro itself, um, I know it's, I think that it comes from the very basic notion that you know, when we spend money, it's something bad, when we earn money, it's good, so when we import, it's bad, when we export, it's, it's good. Um, but, but the bilateral trade deficit is, is a meaningless measure. Um, because um, I, I, for instance, I'm, I have a long-standing trade deficit with my dentist, <laughs> right? I, I, you know, I, every time I go, I pay him, um, I never get any money back. <laughs> but it turns out that he, with that money, will go and consume something, and at the end of the story, we're all in this market. And the same thing is happening with Mexican goods and trade in, in all the value chains. But I'm going to say something else, that the trade deficit as an accounting identity reflects the difference between savings and investments in the economy, between the domestic savings and the investment. So I'm not going to get into the macroeconomics of it, but this, this is not an empirical fact. This is an accounting identity. So, so the fact that the US is running a very large trade deficit reflects the fact that the American uh, economy is saving uh, very little. Um, and part of the reason that it's saving very little, it might be because of the monetary expansion that has been happening in the past uh, since the crisis, um, which makes sense. You don't really want to change. I mean, there could be changes in what I'm trying to say. There, in, in order for change the trade deficit, there should be a structural change in how Americans are saving, which could come out of, for instance, monetary policy. Uh, but increasing the interest rate right now to uh, to um, incentivize people to save more is not the smartest thing you can do coming out of a recession. But by the way, I'm not surprised that because the interest rate is actually going up and it's expected to go up, that the administration will take credit for when they actually, uh, the actual trade deficit goes down. Um, so um, a little bit on the, uh, on the job losses and the gains. Um, I think that the, the story um, that was put out in the campaign actually on both sides, um, definitely with, with, with Trump, with Bernie Sanders, and to some extent also in the Clinton campaign, um, of, of how trade um, uh, has, um, has not been uh, super efficient uh, and has resulted in, in, in job destruction. Um, it, it's, it, it comes out of, connect, of connecting a couple of dots, and really just a couple of dots. First, the fact that America has lost uh, many jobs in, manuf in the manufacturing sector in the past, uh, thing, since, since NAFTA was signed, and the fact that it has been running a current account deficit or a trade deficit. But when you actually look at the numbers, there are a few more facts that could really change this narrative. Um, so yeah, so the U.S. lost about 5 million uh, jobs in manufacturing um, in, in, since the mid-90s until today. Um, and at the same time, the balance of goods with Mexico, the trade balance of goods went from having a surplus to having a, a deficit of $60 billion as of today. Uh, but the story is not as simple. So first, uh, on the aggregate, there's many, many economies that have shown that on the aggregate, there has been a welfare gains from NAFTA, both from the US and from Mexico. Um, but of course, there have been winners and losers as well. So consumers have increased their purchasing powers. Sometimes this comes at the expense of, of some workers in certain industries losing their jobs. Um, but I think that this story I'm telling you, it, you, 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 you can reach it after really using some very fancy mathematical models and some very complicated data analysis. And, and the problem that we economists have in conveying this, simplic this in simplicity is, is part of what made the case of using trade as a scapegoat um, in many political campaigns, not only in the U.S., but also around the world. So, so, so let, me let me just summarize this with some, some facts. All advanced economies have lost jobs in manufacturing, regardless of whether they were uh, running a trade deficit or a trade surplus. Germany has lost jobs in, 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 in manufacturing and many other countries too. So the U.S. lost about 5 million jobs, but the manufacturing output in the U.S. increased by about $800 billion, which explains... The second point, that many of these jobs, or the vast majority of these jobs, were not lost to trade. They were lost to technology and increases in productivity. There are some studies out there, one of them from Robert Scott of the, of the Economic Policy Institute, and they, they est estimate that the net uh, job losses in NAFTA has been a, of about 100,000 
out of the five million jobs that were lost. And that is a really a tiny amount. I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about it, but it's really not as catastrophic, it's by far not catastrophic as they think. But third, jobs have been created uh, after NAFTA because if you actually look at the numbers, it's not only consumers who are benefiting from importing from NAFTA, but firms are benefiting quite a bit. If you look at the, egg, at the imports for, for, of Mexico to the United States, more than 50, about 50% of them are intermediate goods, meaning that American firms are importing these goods to allow them to become more competitive and export abroad and also create jobs. Also, if you look, uh, about 35% of the, of, the, of the imports are in the automotive, automotive industry, but also within that sector, half of those are also intermediate goods for the American car companies. So all in all, this idea that uh, trade, uh, to look at trade only at how he's using the trade deficit and he's making job losses and not taking into account the fact that he's making firms and America more productive and more competitive, I think it's, it's, it's really misleading. So just two thoughts to conclude a little bit maybe on, on policy. One thing that is, th that is maybe more a philosophical question, I'm not going to answer, but I'm going to post it out there, is, is this idea that, that when we are, when some protectionists are saying we should, we should create tariffs or should protect some industries to stop, uh, to, to avoid workers losing their jobs, I wonder why, why this has to happen at the expense of consumers that are going to have to pay uh, more expensive tomatoes and cucumbers so that farmers can keep their jobs. I'm not saying it's, it's a straightforward answer, but I think it's not, it's not straightforward on both sides. Um, and I, I'm, I'm using the example of agriculture because that's one of the sectors that actually tariffs are still uh, very high uh, all over. Um, but it applies to this case too. Um, and and, and, and one thing is that, as, as it was said in the, in the panel before, yeah, some jobs and some industries are destroyed in trade. Um, and that is, that is unfortunate, but it, that is part of the structural change process that makes economies grow. Uh, more competition will kick out of the market some less productive firms and some less productive industries. And that process in which the, the resources, the workers and the machine go from the least productive industries to the most productive industries is the process that explains growth and, and productivity growth. Uh, and that is the biggest challenge that the US economy has. How are we gonna uh, um, make the, how are we gonna uh, overpass the productivity growth slowdown that it's, that it's uh, been happening? And trade is an answer to, more trade is the answer to it, not less of it. And finally, um, my advice to the administration, um, if somebody's listening, me, listening <laughs> is that if, if they really want to stand out in terms of trade, um, the answer to, to, to the discontent that there is out there, which is a valid discontent of people who have lost jobs and, and industries that have been shattered and factories that have left, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not <laughs> saying that's not important, but if you actually want to make a difference, so the way to do it is to really create the proper safety nets <clears throat> for those people to help them transition to another industry, or even to retirement, probably in most cases. And that's something that really no other administration has done before, or at least not, not, not in a very deep way. So that would be the way that this administration could really stand out in helping uh, the American uh, worker. Thank you, Danny, for helping us frame the trade debate, which is so important. Um, Guy, would you like to go next and talk about the US position on the NAFTA renegotiations? <clears throat> well, thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me. I look at the audience, and I see a room full of experts, uh, many of them economists, but all experts. Um, the ambassadors, of course, I see my old friend Mike Finger there, who's hiding, and Kim Elliott, many others. Um, so, kind of where to start? Well, I think uh, Dan has, has put the economist and expert argument extremely well. Uh, across the street at our institute, uh, and Kim was there, uh, Alan Blinder at lunchtime uh, explained quite brilliantly why economists have not sold the free trade medicine over 200 years. We've had 200 years since Ricardo, and there's still no sale, as this <laughs> current <laughs> debate indicates. Uh, and when we take the antipathy to trade and globalization generally in the United States, it really is hyper-focused on NAFTA, an agreement made in Washington, made in 
Mexico City and Ottawa, and um, uh, uh, with a developing country, all these reasons which are very familiar to people in this room. So it's, it's quite a, an uphill battle that the experts uh, in this room and Dan and Antonio and myself face. Now, just coming to the uh, kind of the U.S. side of the picture, it's, I think it's well to start with the umbrella that President Trump puts on trade. His umbrella is the theme of fairness, as he interprets it. And under that theme of fairness, there are two sub-themes, as Nan has mentioned, others have mentioned. One is trade deficits, bilateral trade deficits with a free trade partner country are evidence of unfairness. I mean, it proves itself as far as he's concerned, and also as far as a great many Americans are concerned. And the second is a little more technical, but not a whole lot more technical. It's what I call mirror image reciprocity, and some people call level reciprocity. In other words, if the other country has barriers that we, the United States, does not, and the other country is a partner of ours, especially if it's a free trade partner, it is unfair by definition. So that's the dairy issue with Canada. But there are plenty of other issues, and we, we can go into the details on them. In fact, Secretary Ross will go into the details because one of the multiple executive orders, which uh, he's carrying out in the next couple of months, is one on the sources of the trade deficit. He will draw on the National Trade Estimates Report uh, on foreign trade barriers, and he will choose out the most important sources, and all of those will fall in this category of mirror image reciprocity, or rather lack of mirror image reciprocity. So we'll find things with Mexico, with Canada, and of course China, and so forth and so on. So that's the big agenda. Now, there are three separate negotiations going on to deal with this agenda. And the one we're talking about, I guess, in this panel, generally is supposedly the NAFTA negotiation. But there are two other negotiations which are equally important. They're not even negotiations, but two other uh, fora which are equally important and will have faster delivery. One is Trump's direct talks with CEOs of major companies. He's done it already, and you know the examples, and he will do more of it. And he will convey to them, as long as he's, I guess, has some authority as president, that you will do much better with the U.S. government, Defense Department, or other departments, if you make an announcement of a major plant, a lot of employees, and so forth. And that's going to go on. And I think that pays politically. It, you know, it leads to, a, it leads to a, a number, a concrete number, and a concrete place, concrete company, Apple, whatever. Toyota, many companies are available. So that's, that's an important feature of our present kind of reconfiguration of trade policy. It's something we haven't done. I won't say we've never done it, but we certainly haven't done it in this um, amplitude. Okay, the, the second non-negotiation but, but very important fora are unilateral trade actions, and I've written a piece on this, and I think everybody in this room knows it, but the president has not quite unlimited but almost unlimited authority to stop trade and other commercial relations, finance if he wants, intellectual property transfers if he goes into that, and so on. And he's beginning to use it. Now, Mexico so far has been rather spared, but don't hold your breath, because look at what's happened to Canada. Now, Canada is a good neighbor, as is Mexico, but it's been a good neighbor longer than Mexico. It's been a military ally. It is currently an ally in terms of the Arctic and so forth, and our NORAD, I mean, I, you, you can go on. And what do we have? We have softwood lumber, we have Boeing versus Bombardier, and in the wings we have steel and aluminum. 
And of course, dairy was mentioned. I mean, you know, that's policy right there. And out of this kind of trade deficit report and so forth, I'm sure you can find three or four actions which you can start to take against uh, Mexico as well. We haven't seen it yet, but I, I think it's yet to come. Okay, let's come to the supposed NAFTA negotiations. Uh, both uh, of the very distinguished Mexican ambassadors have left, and I, I've known many Mexican ambassadors, uh, but I, so it's probably just as well they've left because I'm going to disappoint them. <laughs> this negotiation, this so-called NAFTA negotiation, if it's completed this year, that will certainly surprise me. Why? There is a Congress to be considered. When you talk about something as big as NAFTA, you engage not only the border states, my home, I regard my home state as New Mexico, but I grew up in California, Texas, you engage all of those congressmen and senators. You also engage the northern border states, and you engage a lot of states in between. And those congressmen and senators, they've begun to talk back. It's true that, as Nancy correctly said, I mean, there are losers when we have a trade agreement, and uh, we've gone through the numbers on that, if anybody cares to, to read it. I'm not sure the numbers make a lot of difference to the political debate. But now there are people invested in jobs which have to do with the continuation of the present level of trade uh, with both Mexico and Canada. And it's about $1.3 trade, two-way trade with our two neighbors. I mean, it's a, just a tremendous amount. So those congressmen and senators, they're not going to give the administration a pass, and they're starting right here and right now with this 90-day window, and they're going to really put the squeeze on Lighthizer to get away from these generalities, this two-page nonsense, and get right down to the specifics and the priority, the priority. And there's a big battle. All the lobbyists, my good friend Antonio is probably would be considered in this, they're going to be enriched by trying to get their issue higher up on the <laughs> priority list. So that's, and you've got the same thing going, I'm sure, in Mexico and Ottawa, in Mexico City and Ottawa. So that's got to make it very long. And all trade negotiations last longer than they were ever advertised to begin with. So the notion that this will be wrapped up by December, I think, is, is, is a dream. But there's a further reason why it won't be wrapped up by December, even though everybody says they should, should do it, and that's this. Look, at if, if, if Trump and the two capitals actually wrapped up this negotiation, for the reason Danny said and others have said, you know, he's not going to be able to deliver to the American public this huge promise of this reduction of the trade deficit, and therefore, because the reduction of the trade deficit, there's more auto plants going to spring up and reemploy those workers and so forth in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, the battleground states. I mean, it's not going to happen. So he's smart enough, or if he's not smart enough, Gary Cohen is smart enough, maybe even Wilbur Ross is smart enough to tell him it's not going to happen. So if it's not going to happen when you sign the dotted line, you better not sign the dotted line. You better keep the dotted line unsigned so you can continue the political campaign going into the 2018 election. I think my chairman is giving me the signal, so I'll stop right there. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, Mexico's perspective, Antonio? Yes, hello. Um, Mireya, good to be with friends. Um, and I'll give Antonio's perspective. So you are a Mexican. I cannot speak on behalf of the Mexican government, and I'm glad that I now can speak my mind. So... So you, you get, uh, you'll get a piece of my mind. Um, I was asked to provide my thoughts on how Mexico is prepared for the negotiations, its goals and strategies. I'll go over that very quickly. And then share some thoughts on how to upgrade NAFTA. Again, from you know, my perspective, how things are seen from Mexico. In terms of Mexico's preparation for the uh, negoci negotiation, I would say Mexico is very well prepared. First of all, it has the human capital trade experts. This is a non-trivial issue. Not a lot of uh, countries have the, the depth and breadth of trade negotiator expertise. Mexico has some old hands that were sort of uh, colleagues during the original NAFTA negotiation. And the new generation that were steeped in negotiations more recently, the TPP. So they've got that. Secondly, there's the Business Advisory Council that was working with the trade negotiators for the TPP, and that's already up and running, and again, up to speed on the traditional trade issues, 
and new trade issues. That's also very helpful. Thirdly, I would say that NAFTA in Mexico is Thank not you. as controversial now as it was during the original uh, negotiations. In fact, when uh, some uh, U.S. government leaders started speaking about withdrawing from NAFTA or doing away with NAFTA, a lot of voices in Mexico that had originally criticized NAFTA, and yours truly, and some colleagues that were involved in those negotiations suddenly said, whoa, 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 it's not a good idea to get rid of NAFTA. So there is a broad consensus in Mexico, though overall, NAFTA is positive, and they don't want to get... Uh, get rid of it. So I think in terms of preparation, Mexico's uh, really pretty well uh, prepared. In terms of, of the goals, they were ex explicitly set out by President uh, Peña Nieto, and he has mentioned no tariffs and uh, no quotas. That means this is really seen more as a modernization of NAFTA than a renegotiation of NAFTA. And this is not semantics. This is you know, the way Mexico is approaching this. The Mexican government is in favor of including new uh, topics such as uh, telecoms or energy or uh, e-commerce. And the Mexican government has also made it explicit that it wants to wrap up by uh, late this year. And here, there's a striking difference between the current negotiation and the past negotiations. In the past negotiations, the mantra was that the content would determine the timing. And whenever we were asked, when will you mm -hmm. wrap up with, we would, you know, it's a mantra, <clears throat> almost like, you know, yoga-like. The content will determine the timing. Well, <laughs> this time, we really have a tight deadline because I don't see how negotiations can continue next year when there will be two presidents in Mexico, a president in power and a president elect. And elections are, are in June 2018 and the next president will take office until December. So it's a very long changeover period. I don't see how we negotiate during that phase. I think it's very, very difficult to wrap up by uh, December. I don't think it's impossible if countries focus on modernizing rather than renegotiating uh, NAFTA. In terms of the strategies, again, the government has mentioned some principles, but I think they could be seen as strategies. And first of all, it's focusing on a sort of win-win solution. It's not taking a mercantilistic outlook in negotiations. If you do that, you will not be able to reach any agreement. And I think, again, this is not semantics. It's trying to see how it can provide suggestions and solutions for a win-win approach across the whole of, of, of North America. Secondly, it is focusing on trilateral negotiations, not bilateral uh, negotiations with the U.S. And as Ambassador Jerónimo Gutiérrez mentioned, you know, the government's looking at this holistically. It's looking at the economic relationship within which trade is a big part. It's looking at immigration and is looking at, at security. So that's really what's at stake, not because of quid pro quo, but because that's the nature of the relationship. And I, I would say that that will help concentrate minds and hopefully help us uh, do what Gary thinks is nearly impossible. I would tend to agree <laughs> it's very difficult, but hopefully uh, negotiators will, will pull that off. And now let me share just a few ideas about how I see NAFTA being upgraded. I think we have to focus on, on three types of uh, upgrade. First, what I would call internal upgrade, then external upgrade, and then the architecture of the agreement. Regarding internal upgrade, there are a lot of things that should have happened that have not happened. It has nothing to do with modernization of NAFTA. NAFTA negotiators said they would do a number of things they haven't fully done. Let me mention just a few. They would increase the scope and coverage for the temporary entry of business persons. They said they would uh, improve cooperation and commitments regarding competition policy. They said they would uh, improve dispute settlement, especially regarding anti-dumping and countervailing duty, um, issues in which the U.S. has become very active uh, recently. And, um, and they also said they would 
try to find better ways to resolve agricultural disputes. And these past weeks, if for those of us trade policy wonks that uh, focus on Mexico-US trade relations, you've had nothing but sugar, sugar, and HFCS, and tit for tat. Okay, so those are just examples. That's not ex an exhaustive list, but examples of things that could be done now that should have done be uh, before. And my position would be that it's a good time to, to get up to speed on what should have been done, that the Mexican government should not accept any policy reversals in terms of what it already has, in terms of uh, the NAFTA. Some uh, interest groups in the US have been calling for doing away with NAFTA Chapter 19, that's by National Panel Review of Anti-Dumping countervailing Duty uh, Determinations. I don't see why it would be at all in Mexico's interest or Canada's interest to accept that. If there are concerns about Chapter 19, well, then let's fix it, improve it, strengthen it to provide certainty for you know, producers in all three countries. But I, wouldn't see, I don't see what, why Mexico would uh, be willing to do uh, away with that. So this is just some example of what I would call sort of internal upgrade, internal modernization. Regarding external, external modernization, that's what would have taken place if the PPP had entered into force. And if any of you have read the letter sent by USTR Lighthouser, uh, to the Congress on NAFTA modernization. And he does mention NAFTA modernization. He uses that word, okay? Hmm. It looks almost like a chapter listing of the TPP. Whoa, you know, small and medium enterprises, state-owned enterprises, telecoms, e-commerce. Okay, fine. But I think that the politics are very different when you're negotiating between three countries than where you're negotiating between 12 countries. And I'm not sure that you get a better deal negotiating bilaterally or in a small group than negotiating in a big group. I don't see why my Mexico should accept exactly what it accepted in the TPP negotiations because there were many other trade-offs that were possible with the TPP that will not be possible now. So, you know, that's, that's the external sort of upgrade, incorporating these new issues. Um, and in addition, some issues that I think will have to be uh, addressed more in depth um, Ambassador Wayne mentioned regulatory cooperation. I think that will be critically important. Uh, Mexico and the U.S. tried to do that bilaterally through the high-level economic dialogue. And to be frank, I think progress has been slower than expected and that desired and that needed. So that's a very important issue. Secondly, everyone talks about e-commerce. I would talk uh, about sort of the digital economy beyond e-commerce. And there's a small issue related to e-commerce called taxation. Okay, and it was a big deal in the U.S. about whether Amazon should be taxed or not. Now throwing an international dimension to that, the OECD has done a lot of interesting work on e-commerce and taxation. And you know, taxation is not a part of the NAFTA, but that's something that will have to be uh, contemplated. And then, lastly, if I can have a minute, in terms of architecture of the agreement, I would say that. If we only focus sort of on internal and external upgrade, we run the risk of having the new NAFTA 2.0 become obsolete in three or four or five years. NAFTA is really pretty rigid. It's a detailed, long, some would say pretty boring agreement. It's, it's like an old phone book, okay? It has been adjusted slightly in terms of the definition of investor and investment for chapter 11 ISDS. The rules of origin have been tinkered. But overall, it's pretty, pretty much set in stone. Right now, we're in the midst of, uh, of the fourth industrial revolution where you see the convergence of uh, digital technologies, you know, physical technologies, biological technologies. We don't know where, where this will lead to, but it will, it will affect how we produce and how we trade. So now I think that the negotiators have the challenge and the opportunity to craft an agreement that is not as rigid as the original NAFTA, because it's really difficult to sit down and make any changes. So I don't want to sound like Goldilocks, but it has to be sort of you know, flexible enough to incorporate any new developments in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, but not too flexible so that it generates uncertainty for you know, producers and consumers. I don't know what the perfect balance is, but I do think uh, negotiators have to take this into account, and I'm not sure anyone's really discussing uh, this issue. Mm. And then lastly, 
I don't know if the intent, maybe uh, on behalf of the U.S., is to use the new NAFTA as a new template. That is to say, TPP was supposed to be the new template for international trade agreements. We have no TPP. Well, that could be the opportunity or the risk to use NAFTA as a new template. For example, as far as I know, there are no big debates between Mexico, the U.S., and Canada on currency manipulation. The peso has been depreciated because of some uh, unwarranted tweets north of the border, right? So it's, the currency could be manipulated by something that's happening on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, not at the Central Bank of Mexico. But you know, be that as it may, I don't think it's, it's a big issue. But if it's going to be a, a, a platform for other countries, I think we need to make this uh, uh, explicitly and also think about how to deal with the accession clause. Not a lot of people remember that NAFTA has an accession clause. A lot of people have been talking about the withdrawal clause, right? There's an accession clause that says that any country or group of countries can join NAFTA so far as Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. agree to that, right? So if it's, if it's going to be seen as a flexible agreement where you might later incorporate some of the Central American countries that are of, you know, a lot of interest for the U.S. for national security purposes. How are we going to deal with that? I think that's just an open question in terms of the architecture of the agreement. And with that, I'll just leave it open to uh, Thank you. questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Antonio. Fantastic. So I think we have a whole set of issues to discuss. But I want to focus on one issue that I think has been really driving the discussion. And that is the timeline, how realistic mm. it is really to finish by a year's end. I very much have the same sense as Gary does that if you really sit at the negotiation table by, say, August, it's going to be very difficult to imagine that by the end of the year you can conclude. As a you know, very uh, uh, dear friend of mine who follows trade very closely and is a former trade negotiator it told me, you cannot even negotiate a single rule of origin in that uh, time frame. I mean, and the rules of origin are actually quite political and quite uh, uh, challenging, uh, not only technically, but in terms of the interests that they move. Uh, also because we don't have a consensus even within the United States. When it comes to the rule of origin, car companies and unions may have different views. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, and Gary would like if you could also comment on, you know, we don't really know what is driving the Trump administration. Is it really modernization as implied in the USTR letter or is it a renegotiation in terms of what the political advisors may be advising mm. is the function of trade policy? So if we, don't, if we don't have that certainty as to what will be the position of the U.S. government, and then Antonio, um, when I hear about, and I completely agree with the set of issues you're putting on the table, when you're talking about an after that is less rigid, that can address the new uh, uh, you know, realities of technology and production, when you talk about defending Chapter uh, um, 19, when you talk about the fact that Canada and Mexico gave some things as part of TPP, well, they will not give them as part of NAFTA, I would say all of that suggests that it cannot be done by the end of the year. So um, what, what happens, I think we should start you know, thinking about a high probability scenario that NAFTA talks is spill over not only 2018, may actually go even further than that, and it's going to be different electoral cycles that will have an impact. Next year is Mexico's presidential election, but it's also the midterm, and eventually you might even talk about the uh, presidential re-election campaign of uh, Mr. Trump. So I think we have to consider the fact that this may be a long, drawn-out process, and what that does to the Mexican economy, what that mm -hmm. does to U.S.-Mexico relations. Uh, comments on these points that you may have? Who do you want to start? Uh, Gary, why don't you go first? Okay, well, you and I are in, are in sympathy on this. It is true that if, um, you know, uh, President Trump had a, um, <clears throat> a real conversion on the road to Damascus uh, yes, and, and really thought, well, yeah, we want to modernize and so forth, as Antonio has said, yes, you might get some steps in that direction within this year, but that is so at contrast with his rhetoric, and he has this whole wing in his um, uh, in, in his uh, government. He's got Navarro. He has, um, and say Navarro's in charge of Hire Americans by America. Well, by America, the way it's interpreted by the Trump administration is a complete negation of the government procurement agreement in the WTO and the NAFTA agreement. And, and Navarro is going to spend his time pushing this down to the states and to private firms. You saw what happened on pipelines. So, and you have Lighthizer, Robert Lighthizer, he's technically 
extremely able, brilliant, but he, his position has been clear for 30 years. He's not in favor of this kind of stuff. And then we have Wilbur Ross, who's the trade policy guru. So you have this whole wing who is really not in favor of a modernization agenda. They have another agenda in mind. But then you have the Goldman Sachs wing, Gary Cohen and maybe Manchin and Juster and some others. So there's this kind of battle within the White House. If it were resolved in one way, it is conceivable that you might have a quick negotiation which would essentially adopt what happened in TPP, but that seems, I just think that is quite inconsistent. And so I think if you add that position with what Antonio said, you end up with the NAFTA negotiation going at least to 2019. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Antonio and then and Danny, do you have any comments? Yes. Um... I mean, this is a town full of lawyers, so... Um, I'm not a lawyer, but... Mireya and I do political economy, so I can take a swipe. But I guess it depends how you define conclude. Oh, I see. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That's so, an idea for a tweet. Yeah, that's yeah, a lawyer then. <laughs> no. And l let me tell you how, how I think it could theoretically be pulled off. First of all, you negotiate over the general architecture of the agreement basic principles, what is the baseline, what, where there will be no reversal, and you strike something like a peace clause, mm -hmm. right? So you create certainty and stability for political actors while you reach an agreement instead of sending signals that, you know, everything's up for grabs and maybe chapter 19 is going to go away and, you know, um, it's a, you know, complete mercantilistically driven Negotiation. So you establish broad principles, you, you do a, 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 a peace clause, you advance as much as you can, and then you can you know, sort of establish some, say, some, some working groups, say, rules of origin, okay? Rules of origin are very complicated. You could lay out some principles. We will not disrupt regional supply chains. Having said that, you, we will try to have as much regional content as possible. And once we have uh, rules of origin agreed upon, they will have a transition phase, like there's usually a transition phase for tariff reductions, so that if there are any adjustments that need to be made, those adjustments uh, can be made. And then you can leave a, a lot of stuff for what's called the legal scrub mm -hmm. that can take uh, a long time. So for, for me, just making a clear and direct statement of what the aims are, sort of what's in, what's out and what will happen until you reach an agreement would go a long way towards creating a stability uh, in, in the markets. And also um, an additional thing that I think is worth mentioning is that this is you know, trade policy, but a lot of trade politics, right? Mm -hmm. Mexico is now the major investor in the US, Mexican multinational corporations. So if I cannot speak for their CEOs, but I think they've kept a pretty low profile. Mm -hmm. And if they had a higher profile, just stating how much they've invested in the U.S., how they're creating jobs in the U.S., how they would be willing to invest more in the U.S. if we remain good neighbors as opposed to distant neighbors, and if there are you know, good trade and investment rules for regional trade, then that could be a positive thing and maybe have a few... I'm not being sarcastic, but a few you know, true photo ops and say, look, this is this plant by Bimbo has state of the art facilities. It's producing, you know, great Thomas English muffins or Antimus donuts or what have you. I think that could be also part of the solution. You have to be really creative. Uh, and that is very creative, Antonio. And I think you're a voice of reason, but I would just, you know, play devil's <laughs> advocate and I'll go to that in a second. And I would say that when you mention a peace clause that provides a stability and certainty, I think we can all agree with that. But what I hear the messaging from the Trump administration is that uncertainty provides leverage in negotiations. And therefore, the notion is that you want to keep the other side guessing as to what might happen. So where they'd be willing to provide a kind of assurance when they see that the negotiation with Mexico, I think, remains to be seen. But the, the approach is very creative. Uh, Danny? I, 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 I just want to comment just two things. I don't know about the specifics um, as my colleagues, but just if you look at history, I mean, the Uruguay round lasted from 1986 to 1994. The Doha development round, which mm. these are multilaterals, right? So it's 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 more complicated, but it's it's yeah. But even if you 
let's say, like take it by half. So the Doha round, sorry, in 2001, it was supposed to end by 2005, is still going on. So, so I tend to agree that this is something that it's, uh, I mean, it's, we're talking about years. The, the, the alternative thing that I think could happen, which has nothing to do with Trump and nothing to do with Mexico, um, but he, Trump will take credit for it, is like when and if the Federal Reserve Board keep increasing the interest rate uh, in the next year or two, that will, that will have, uh, I think, uh, that, that will have an effect on, on lowering the trade deficit. Um, and if the peso keeps appreciating a little bit more, that's also going to happen. So I think if, if those two, you know, all the stars suddenly align and that happens, he might, uh, the administration might say, well, we actually lower the trade deficit. It, we're so good that even without negotiations, we lower the trade <laughs> deficit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Danny. Questions from the audience? There's a microphone, yeah. so if you can please, um, this gentleman here, identify yourself and be very concise so we have time for more questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Will Malden with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, just asking to uh, follow up. It's hard to look into the future politically from, from where we are right now, but I guess if the, uh, what I'd like to ask um, uh, Gary and Antonio and anyone else, if the negotiations aren't concluded by the time of the Mexican election, what it, what is the um, fallout for the negotiations? On the other hand, if if the U.S. election if if they're not done by the U.S. midterm elections or even by the uh, next presidential election season, which seems to start earlier and earlier mm -hmm. these days, what are the possible repercussions? What could happen to NAFTA? What could happen to the Mexican-U.S. trade relationship? Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Antonio, when we go with you first this time. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I would say that there are different scenarios depending on which candidate wins the election next year. There is, I would say, broad support across the political spectrum in Mexico to maintaining NAFTA. It's not perfect, but if the question is, are you better off with or without, most people will say, I'm better off with NAFTA. That might not be the case for all of the uh, people supporting uh, Lopez Obrador. So that would be a different scenario and you know, there would be you know, a great deal of, uh, of uncertainty. For, for some companies, you know, the, the, the backup would be if, if that means there's no NAFTA, you know, the, the region would uh, be governed under WTO rules and most favored nation uh, tariffs. In that case, I would say the U.S. exporters would be put in an adverse position because Mexico's MFN, the WTO tariffs, are much higher than, than the ones of the U.S. So Mexican exporters would have much easier access to the U.S. market than would U.S. exporters to the Mexican market, especially so agricultural exporters. And they've been speaking out by saying, hey, Mexico's a very big market. It's an important market. Don't don't mess with it. I hope that we don't uh, reach that uh, situation, but that would be the case. And then just briefly commenting on, on uh, Mireya's point that you know, uncertainty is a negotiation strategy. Yes, but there's also Mexican politics, and too much uncertainty could backfire mm -hmm. on the U.S. Right now, there's an initiative in the Mexican Senate that would compel the, the, the Mexican government to source its corn from Argentina and Brazil, and not from the U.S. And Mexico's upgrading its trade agreements with Europe, with the EU, with EFTA, with Argentina, and Brazil. So I think that could be counterproductive uh, uh, for the U.S. And I guess the onus would be on those U.S. exporters that really rely on the Mexican mar market to be much more outspoken. They were very outspoken when there was uh, the fear that the U.S. would suddenly withdraw from NAFTA. So that's that's what it would take. I would say that. Yes, it's difficult, but not impossible to play out with my scenario. I want to see it in an open. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, Gary? Okay. Um, well, we'll ask uh, the right question, as he often does. If it's not done by the midterm uh, uh, elections, what are the repercussions in the U.S.? Well, there, there, there's the other two negotiations which I talked about, and they will be done. Trump will get more CEOs to line up and pledge. And he will put on sectoral, he'll have sectoral agreements. We're headed for one in soft and lumber. We've had four of them already. We're certainly going to get a fifth. And we're certainly headed for one in steel. Now, the, and 
Lighthizer is a master of negotiating these sectoral deals. And in steel, the strength that Mexico and Canada have is that they are the destinations of the 8 million tons of U.S. exports of steel. But they also supply us about 8 million tons. But there'll be some kind of nice deal which will have a global impact, which will raise the price of steel. And we'll pr probably get more, you know, the, certainly the shares will go up, but also we might get a few few more workers. But it's not going to stop there. There, Who knows what he's going to get on autos? He might go company by company. You get GM or Ford or whatever to promise, you know, their internal balance of production in the United States versus what happens in Canada and Mexico and it's kind of more shaded. I mean, so there will be things to talk about in the midterm election, even if there's no sign on the dotted line on the new NAFTA. In fact, I would say you don't want that sign. I've already said that. You don't want that signing on the dotted line. You want that as the promise for the next two years of the administration. Thank you. We have time for another question. This lady. Hi, Emily Meredith. I'm a reporter at Energy Intelligence. And I have a more basic question, which is, you know, if there's broad support, like Antonio said, in Mexico right now um, for this NAFTA, uh, possibly in Canada, why participate in renegotiations? Why not just say, you know, we hear you that you don't like it, but we're not going to show up? <laughs> Um, and then sort of related, you know, what's the danger of going through the motions of renegotiations if um, they don't seem to lead anywhere for years? Uh, who wants to take it? I didn't quite hear the question, so go ahead. Y yes. Uh, w if you like NAFTA, why favor renegotiation? And I would say because that's the only way to keep it alive because of the politics of the U.S. So the status quo is not sustainable. NAFTA's either modernized or adjust it in some way, or it will go away. That's, that's my view. So it, it'll be difficult to just kick the can down the road and, and just you know do nothing. I don't think that's viable in terms of US politics. Secondly, I think it's in Mexico's self-interest to have a much modern and powerful and flexible, uh, and flexible NAFTA. So I think those are the reasons. Mexico was hesitant to participate in the TPP. And I think at the end of the day, it participated because of, not to make gains into the, in the TPP, but to avoid losses from being excluded in a brand new agreement. So Canada's already going to do it with the U.S. regardless. Mexico has to be in, even from a, a, defensive, uh, a defensive position. I would say those are the reasons why it's, uh, it's, it's at the table. And also because the alternative, as Antonio said before, is that when if, if NAFTA, I mean, if they say, well, you're just going to show up and the United States decides to withdraw, which is the nuclear option, then the law of the land becomes the, the World Trade Organization. And there, um, the tariffs um, that the U.S. will have to face if they want to export to Mexico are more higher and vice versa too, right? So, so the U.S. will also have, they're not as high, but the Mexican exporters will also have to pay more tariffs when they export to the U.S. So it's a... It's, it's a win-win situation. To keep it. Thank you very much. I understand there's a lot of interest, but we have another panel. It's a very tight uh, schedule, so we have to transition. We're going to talk next about security and border issues, but please uh, join me in thanking the panelists for this discussion. And